Nice to see you all here today. Um, we're delighted to have with us Nadia Tolkonikova. Um, her return to the Mitchell Center after speaking at the Penn Political Union last month. Um, Nadia, as many of you know, is one of the founding members of the eclectic Russian feminist punk rock group Pussy Riot, whose performance art is provocative, edgy, and at times deliberately shocking. Outspoken critics of the Russian government, Pussy Riot members are also supporters of LGBTQ rights, women's rights, anti-capitalism efforts, and a broad range of social issues. Arrested in February 2012 for her participation in a performance the group described as a punk prayer near the altar of Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Savior with the title Virgin Mary, Chase Putin Away, Nadia was imprisoned in Siberia. As the Slovenian philosopher Slavo Žižek notes during an exchange of letters between him and Nadia during her imprisonment, what is so disturbing about Pussy Riot to the liberal gaze is that you make visible the hidden continuity between Stalinism and contemporary global capitalism. You are nothing less than the critical awareness of us all sitting in prison. Appearing in public spaces such as subways, rooftops, and garages, Pussy Riot often appears in ski masks and acid bright tights to perform what Nadia describes as, quote, a kind of civic activity amidst the repressions of a corporate political system that directs its power against basic human rights and civil and political liberties. We're also very pleased to have with us today Kevin Platt, who's Professor of Russian and East European Studies at Penn, where he's the Edmund J. and Louise W. Kahn Term Professor in the Humanities, an author of numerous works, including the 2011 book, Terror and Greatness, Ivan and Peter as Russian Myths, and before that, History in a Grotesque Key, Russian Literature and the Idea of Revolution. I want to thank Kevin, for being the moderator of our discussion. And once again, thank Nadia for returning to the Mitchell Center and to Penn. I look forward to the conversation that ensues. Turn it over to you now, Kevin. Thank you, Jeff. Nadia, are you with us? There you are. I'm so glad. Hi. To... Thank you for joining us. Um, Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here today. Um, I'm really glad to see too that we have a pretty robust attendance as well. Just a couple of words to the uh, audience um, about the format for our discussion today. Um, Nadia and I are going to have um, a conversation for about 40 minutes, um, during which time I'll pose her a number of different questions and I expect questions will come up from the audience. And I'd like to encourage everyone to use the Q&A function to post your questions, uh, even during the discussion with Nadia. Um, there's gonna be a, about 45 minutes after we finish the um, moderated discussion uh, for Q&A from the audience. So we'll go back to all the questions that you've posted and see if we can answer as many as we can. Um, one additional uh, request, if you're in um, a Penn class, uh, please uh, just note that you are a Penn student in your Q&A question because it would be interesting for us to know that and also um, we'll try and get to student questions uh, although we'll of course try and address everyone's questions as well uh, but we'll make a, a, a special effort to aggregate the student questions. So all that being said let's start with the this momentous event um, that Jeff started his introduction uh, with which is the punk prayer of 2000 and 12, um, I think everyone in the audience probably remembers it. I'm sure Nadia remembers it. Um, but just to remind everyone, there was an original punk, punk uh, protest song, uh, partially filmed in an unauthorized event in the Church of Christ the Savior in Moscow on February 21, 2012, uh, that addressed, among other things, sexism, patriarchy in the Russian Orthodox Church, and official church support for Vladimir Putin, who was up for re-election that year. The film version of the song immediately went viral uh, in the internet, invigorating the Russian in opposition, but also attracting the repressive attentions of the state. Um, Nadezhda, clearly that event shaped your biography, um, most notably by landing you in prison, convicted for, quote, hooliganism motivated by religious hatred, end quote. How do you yourself look back on that event? How did it change you as an artist and as an activist? What did you learn from that event? Um, well, 
it's really difficult for a Russian activist to uh, get inside prison unless we are imprisoned by ourselves. And uh, it prison system is a really closed system pretty much everywhere. Maybe in just um, in Europe, in mostly in Scandinavian countries, they make a conscious effort to make it more open to the public. But still, uh, if, if you are uh, monitoring prison conditions, so difficult to get inside. So we made impossible. We spent there two years learning uh, about prison conditions. And it is actually, it was really tough experience, definitely. And I'm still struggling with some consequences of this experience. Um, I'm struggling with depression and um, it triggered depression for the first time. And then it just lasts with me pretty much forever. Um, but um, with all the bad sides, that we also enjoyed this great knowledge of uh, how prison system treats a human being. So when we got out, both in our art practice and in our activist practice, we started to pay much more attention to issues of um, of prison labor, of prison system, of um, of something that's basically today is uh, a legal slave. Um, labor um, and it doesn't exist only in countries like mine it exists in your country as well and probably you're well aware of this and um, ever since I got out of jail I never could understand how three people like me and you can um, walk around with um, with um, like with no um, with a good mental image of themselves without actually thinking about all those people who are imprisoned um, a lot of times for nothing. We have our own drug war inside Russia and um, Putin prides himself in imprisoning people who are um, just having drugs on them. And many people who I saw in prison, they um, ended up there because they just uh, possessed uh, weed, which is which is clearly not a crime. Um, another big portion of women, uh, they um, they would end up in prison because of uh, domestic violence, because we don't have a law against domestic violence, and they would answer to their offender to just protect their lives. And um, they we we do have. We do have a norm about protecting yourself. So technically under the law in Russia, you can also protect yourself in your life. But uh, this law is never being used. Um, this uh, this article is never being used by courts. So um, in years after uh, we've been released, we started to pay much more attention to topics like domestic violence, like uh, trying to advocate for um, the law against domestic violence in Russia, because it never was implemented. Um, more than that, in 2017, our parliament legalized domestic violence. So right now, if you beat anyone within your household, it's not a crime anymore. It's uh, just a misdemeanor punishable by $100 of max. Um, so it's as I feel like it made us stronger activists. We learned more about the system that they're trying to uh, go against. Um, and I. Honestly, I um, don't really understand why uh, why would governments uh, even create political prisoners because in most of cases it just makes us um, more um, more aware of the system where we are. Uh, it makes us better. It makes us smarter. It makes us more influential, and it makes us uh, believe even more in what we believe uh, in the first place. I mean, it it seems clear that the your group and also the activist movement in Russia learned a lot from 2011 and 2012, but that the state also learned from that experience. Um, would you say that the Russian state changed its tactics with regard to art activism and art protests as a result of the experience of the Pussy Riot event? Um, how has the, so the interaction of the state and activism changed in Russia since 2011-2012? Well, I'm not a scientist, so I may not be objective, but um, I would say they switched over the last few years, over the last five years, actually. 
Um, they switched their tactics from um, imprisoning people for years to imprisoning people for um, dozens of days. And uh, actually, well, when you're really active and you make numerous actions um, in a year, it becomes effectively uh, like really, really tiring because some people like Alexei Navalny, who was also poisoned this year, they would spend like of the quarter or one third of their year in prison. And, you know, anytime when they give you 20 days or 30 days in jail, it doesn't sound so terrible. So, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Western media are not uh, crying about it because it's just 20 days, but effectively because it's, it's happening every time when you try to make an action, um, it actually stops you from from being effective and from being um, from being a member of society. Basically, you can you can truly really work. Um, many people were fired because of uh, these new tactics, and uh, I think it's really smart. I have to <laughs> I have to admit that um, my government was kind of smart about it because um, they were definitely really dumb and ineffective uh, when they put Putin right in jail because. Um, because instead of silencing us, they just gave us bigger, bigger platform. So now um, the cops, the political police, FSB, um, and this special center against extremism, it's like Department of Russian Police, they uh, they try to diverse, diversify their tactics. Um, they're still pretty dumb because at the moment when they uh, tried to murder Alexei Navalny and they did not do it. They gave him enormous power. And I think if one day Alexei Navalny will become president of Russia, he will become, um, um, in, in, in a lot of, um, a big, big part of this reason, big, big part of uh, uh, even the cause that would be this poisoning. Because, you know, when you poison your political opponent, you actually give him power and you, validate them as um, as someone who is equal to you. Absolutely. Um, so I also wanted to mention that today um, one activist of Pusaret, uh, who whose name is Rita Flores, uh, she was sentenced to 20 days in jail. So up until Christmas, up until New Year, she's going to be in jail for an action that she and another member of Pusaret, Masha Alexina, also spent two years in jail before um we shared the same case um but she uh they um they made an action in support of political prisoners and against political uh against police repression and for that she's going to spend 20 days in jail it's uh one thing i wanted to insert here is one of the members of the audience uh is having difficulty hearing you and would oh. request that you be a little closer to the mic that would be great i actually um, have mic here but let me try to use my computer mic this sounds a little bit louder, actually, now that you're, yeah, this sounds a little better, I think. Um, it's interesting the way that you describe the, um, you know, transition in the tactics of the state. It sounds very similar, actually, to the learning curve that the Soviet state progressed over in the 1960s and 1970s. Mm. Are you back? I'm back. So let's just try if this will be better. It One, sounds... Two, it sounds louder to me, maybe a little less clear, but certainly louder. So that's fine. Okay. Let's awesome. Finish up. Um, so um, I wanted to ask one more question about the, the you know, the consequences of the Pussy Riot Punk Prayer uh, for you. It was an event which really vaulted you from um, the, you know, position of an important participant in Pussy Riot, which was already a quite visible activist group associated also with Voyna. Um, it can't be said that it was not um, a known quantity in Russian cultural and activist political life. But really, the, as you said, the Pussy Riot Punk Prayer and the response of the state um, gave you a platform, a huge platform. It vaulted you in the course of a month to international prominence um, and then to celebrity uh, that continued throughout the, pro the trial and imprisonment following your release. What have you learned about how politics, art, celebrity are interconnected and organized uh, in Russia or in the world uh, as a result of this experience, this kind of looking glass experience um, 
into the uh, world of international fame and influence. Okay. My microphone is going crazy. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, I wish I knew more about Russian celebrities. Um, they are afraid of Pussy Red really <clears throat> um, a lot because basically in Russia, uh, our position in Russia and our position in Europe, United States, New Zealand, the West, um, it's really different. It starts. Um, it started to shift a little bit towards uh, Pussy Riot becoming more um, mainstream over the last few years in Russia, which is because um, activists, protests, anti anti Kremlin issues started to become truly mainstream. And kids on TikTok, they're um, they're all hating Putin. They're all pro feminist and pro LGBTQ. Plus, so I wouldn't say that we personally have done something about going more, more mainstream in Russia, but just the whole history turned into direction that we um, we followed since 2010. Um, so in Russia, I'm still just about to discover the celebrity world, but in in the West, it was pretty surreal for me. Um, the moment when I got out of jail in 2013, in the, in the very end of 2013, and um, just in the months I, I uh, when we traveled to New York, I think that was the one of the greatest events when we made uh, a fundraiser for our friends and partners, the Voice Project um, organization that supported us, um, led by Hunter Heaney. Um, they support artists all around the world who were imprisoned for their art. Um, and they supported us a lot during our trial, so we decided to make a fundraiser for them. And we made it in New York, and um, um, we were overwhelmed by the amount of people who came. And uh, it was the first time when we met Marina Abramovich, we met Kim Gordon, um, and Many of, the, many of those people who we never thought we, we were going to meet in our lives, who were our icons and um, gurus and, and people who we looked up to. Um, but um, <laughs> some, of, some, of this, uh, some of these interactions, they were um, weird um, because, uh, for example, Madonna was trying to make a movie about us and, and buy our something that her lawyers called our life rights. And um, I think I think that it was really crazy to interact all of a sudden uh, for, for, for a band that never spent more than $30 on making a concert with this global capitalist celebrity world. But um, because also we were not completely naive and we were not political virgins at the time, definitely um, we, were, we were naive in terms of our experience of interacting with celebrities, that's for sure, but um, all of us had some sort of political background of studying philosophy, so, you know, we had theoretical knowledge that you guys are gaining, all of you guys gaining in university, and that's so fucking important, because then later you can totally use it in life. Maybe right now it doesn't feel so, but <laughs> so I started to um, just question. Thank you for that. As a and, university uh, professor. <laughs> no, no, I know. Um, well, uh, um, I, I, I know this. Actually, I do appreciate your work so much because it's it must be so difficult. When I was a student, I was such an asshole. I was thinking that I have to... I have to the biggest asshole in the room and question like literally everything what my professors say. And now when I give lectures or you know, conversations like this one by myself, I realized how mean and not constructive I was. <laughs> anyway, um, we would just try to question motivations of people with whom we meet, be always aware of the context and not uh, let them use us or at least when um, when we are used, try to use another side as well. Like, for example, when we were invited to the uh, Senate of the United States uh, to talk about Russian political prisoners, um, 
it was an amazing opportunity. Like definitely it would bring a lot of um a lot of press to um to those issues that we are going to raise there. So we wouldn't say no, but um besides um besides talking about Russian political prisoners, we thought it would be important to tackle issues of um American political prisoners who exist um as well. Nobody really talks about them, at least in mainstream. Uh, mainstream media. Um, and at the time, uh, we were concerned uh, about the case of Cecily McMillan, Occupy Wall Street protester, who was um, in pretrial detention in uh, Rikers Island in New York. And uh, her crime was that she allegedly elbowed a policeman who was trying to arrest her and I mean, who was arresting her. And he grabbed her by her breast and she elbowed him. I mean, of course, you couldn't do that, even if she did that. Um, and also that our officer had really, really bad record. He was um, an abuser for a long time and there, there is evidence of it in the press. So um, we, we just, uh, we, we talked about that as well, like all the senators and um, this all this Congress, men and women uh, surrounded us and they were not fully prepared for that. So, I mean, every time I think when we, we have a chance to use platform, we're trying to be critical of uh, the platform itself um, in a constructive way. We have cases like that developing this year in Philadelphia as a result of the BLM protests earlier this year, um, activists who've been arrested as a result of that um, in similar kinds of circumstances too. Are they in prison right now? Yeah, I think they're actually out on bail. There's a very mm -hmm. prominent activist from West Philadelphia who was arrested um, under um, accusations of violence during the protests. Um, so on a similar kind of a note, you know, the, I imagine, I've never been an art activist, um, but I imagine that there's an invigorating sense of freedom mm -hmm. involved with public protest actions like the punk prayer or many of the other actions um, that Pussy Ride engaged with over the years. Um, do you feel like the, the institutions of the music industry, um, the kinds of more professionalized recording experiences and dissemination experiences um, limit your ability to express radical views or limit the meanings that are available to the, to the work? How do you negotiate the, the sort of media which are put at your disposal as a result of this transformation in, in the place of Pussy Riot in order to leverage it to serve your purposes? Um, I still can use uh, performances. I still can use actions as my method, as many of my colleagues use. Um, so good thing about Pussy Riot and good thing about co-founding Pussy Riot, you feel like a proud member of a really big family with lots of grand grand kids who are sometimes doing much better than you do. And um, but you know that um, um that you are one of the metrics and it feels it feels really cool. <laughs> so I know like since um, me and my friend Kat founded Pussy Red in the end of 2011, um, the movement grew so much, we never could believe um, that it actually would happen. It was our goal from the very beginning to, to bring our ideas to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. We were really, really ambitious, but uh, for no reason. We were ambitious for no reason because we were freaks at the time. Nobody would be a feminist or even all LGBTQ plus activists in Russia at the time. I mean, there were activists, but nobody would hear them even within um, and the Kremlin community. Uh, people were not homophobes, but they would say that it's not important to talk right now about feminism because we still did not, um, uh, we did not overthrow Putin and we don't want to um, distract people mm -hmm. from, from the main issue. So uh, most of, m for most of the people, including actually my partner at the time, Petsy Verzilov, uh, with whom we made millions of actions, um, it was not obvious why, why we would tackle feminist issues so hard. So uh, we wanted to build a feminist um, rainbow movement. Um, and I, actually by some, by some miracle it did happen. So 
nowadays I can enjoy um, learning about different mediums because um, I feel like it's important for me to grow into different mediums as an artist and and use um, you know, use as much mediums as I can um, because it would be a pretty damn conservative to just follow the same tactics over and over again. And um, I'm really glad that um, actions are still happening. Um, I don't know if you've seen that actions, like really amazing action with rain rainbow flags that were uh, that was done by um, activists of Pussy Red in Russia two months ago. Mm -hmm. um, they they put rainbow flags uh, in the buildings um, and the mo most important government buildings all around Moscow. Um, and regarding music industry, I'm not really deep inside the music industry. I actually did have a lot of conversations with um, major labels at uh, some point in 2015 when I just started to explore uh, music as my medium. Um, and uh, I've been in all those buildings and you know, Capitol Records and Sony and Epic wanted to sign me and Interscope. Um, wanted to send Pussy Red, um, but um, it's not it's not really my crowd. It's not really a crowd of Pussy Red, and it's it's obvious you don't want to enter that family that you're going to hate. So I, um, but I also see that uh, Pussy Red uh, is just a part of a bigger movement of musicians who are um, recording music, making music videos, making audiovisual art without actually being connected to big institutions, and they. Um, they're still um, have really big platform and they're um, you know changing paradigms in their own way. Uh, musicians like Dorian Electra, uh, who is a, a gender and genre bending uh, queer musician uh, who became recently in the last two years uh, really really prominent for their album Flight Flamboyant in every in every of their videos, they question things like, um, you know, masculinity, femininity. Um, they they learn about alt right movement and they like, all the all the crazy stuff that's happening, guys, in your country. Um, so and, and they don't even have a manager. Um, they they just um, it's it's basically that they're working. Uh, they're working as uh, monks used to work in uh, in the eighties. They they still up until this day though they have millions of views. They uh, they make videos in their living room. And um, I really I really love this um, this approach. I really love this style because it, you still have access to um, to the medium without actually being captured by the industry. I mean, in some sense, it is the Pussy Riot uh, method extraordinaire, right? It's to figure mm -hmm. out how the platform is changing and then to use it in order to, as the punk prayer did, to use, you know, garage band techniques to reach millions and millions and millions of viewers, um, which is... It happens sometimes. <laughs> it happens sometimes, and it's, it's about the way that platforms are changing in some sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I spoke a lot of, of my trap musicians friends you know they uh, they laugh at, at those musicians who try to fun, finance their sound in um in studios they say that people these days they are they're pretty much about conceptual art because like trap is in a way punk and conceptual art at the same time because they don't really care about the execution they don't really care about quality for for most of trappers thing is quality do not exist <laughs> They, they have lyrics, they have, uh, they have visual um, component, but that's it. Um, I feel pretty comfortable in 2020. I mean, that's been said, I have a lot of questions to the rap world with uh, endless using of gender stereotypes and, but you know, we're going, <laughs> we're going to fight it. And in 2030, we're going to have a conversation again. And um, you'll see the whole, like old trap world will be on the feminist. <laughs> Let's hope. Um, no, I mean, that was one of the questions that I have lined up here. And we only have time for a few more questions from me before we're going to turn to the audience. And I'm sure that the audience has many. Um, but it really was about 2030, really about 2036. Um, the Russian political scene has changed so much over the past 10 years. You know, in 2012, when you performed the punk prayer, um, it really felt like there was a 
kind of a possibility in the air that there could be various different futures for Russia. Um, at this point, it doesn't feel so much like that, at least to me, but maybe it feels differently to you. And I sense that from some of your earlier uh, answers that you feel like things are actually shifting in Russia in a generational way yeah. uh, or perhaps in other ways. What's, what's your prognosis for the future and how do you view this world in which we've, you know, just this past summer made it possible for Putin to be president uh, constitutionally uh, or unconstitutionally, however you view constitutions up until 2036. Um, what's your sense of the, the future for Russia? I think 2036 is um, an irrelevant number because at this point he can just rewrite any law and, and write um, tomorrow he will write 2000. Ten, um, um, 2100. Anyway, um, so for me, uh, this number doesn't mean much. Uh, what means uh, a lot to me um, watching events in Belarus. Uh, I'm sure you guys followed what was happening, what is still happening there. Um, and if you tell Belarusians uh, that uh, around six months ago, that something like that is going to happen in their country. Uh, I think even oppositional leaders, um, even Tikhanovsky and Tikhanovska would just laugh at you um, because um, because they knew that uh, they uh, they knew that most of the people didn't really like Lukashenko, but at the same time, uh, the overall sentiment was that people are not courageous enough, people are not ready, um, maybe not uh, not all the people are ready for democracy. Um, they were saying pretty much exactly same stuff that um, people who explain why why Putin is still in power in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we never know when this trigger moment will happen, and it can be really anything. It can be not another poisoning of the oppositional leader. It can be um, um, parliament elections because in two thousand. 11 uh, elections in our parliament that um, were heavily crooked. They caused a big um, people's movement that lasted for six months and actually had long lasting effects on Russian political system that we are enjoying um, in, even, even today. So um, you never know when it happens, but you can see trends and trends are good, um, trends are encouraging. Um, we saw that Putin's rating um, was all like um, the lowest in the last 13 years this year. Um, and this is just a part of big trends of people's discontent with the government, with uh, their ineffectiveness. It's becoming more and more obvious um, because in the beginning of Putin's term, he was promising stability. Many people bought it because they were really shocked by neoliberal reforms in the 90s and I saw it um, in my parents generation they couldn't follow their dreams they couldn't fulfill their um, um, artistic dreams because they had to earn money to feed me so uh, for a lot of people like my parents um, when Putin came to power and he said I promise you stability it was a good deal but um, not anymore because after 20 years of his it became obvious that a lot of his promises are dull and he, he's never going to make them happen. And also, I feel like his adventure in 2014 against um, Crimea, his, um, his foreign, uh, foreign policy adventure turned against him. It gave him a really big boost uh, at the time in 2014-15. Um, many Russian people celebrated annexation of Crimea. Um, some Russian people celebrated the war in Ukraine. Um, but a few years later, experiencing economic decline, Western sanctions, and, um, you know, overall, uh, overall, um, Russian people still want to be a part of Europe. <laughs> we want eventually to travel, be able to travel to Europe without visas. I remember when I was eight, that was my dream, because I, I thought visas are obscene. Um, and more and more people understand that with um, um, the decline in Russian economy and uh, 
uh, Russia being a bad kid on the world scene, it's not going to be possible. So I feel like we just want normal stuff. <laughs> normal stuff like democratic freedoms, uh, people not being killed for being gay or journalists in the streets, and, um, and, and, and a fucking law against domestic violence. <laughs> You've got to start somewhere. But I mean, I think the, the point that you take about Belarus is, is brilliant. It's, you never know when the revolution is going to happen. Um, the you know predictions that the entire Russian public or American public are brainwashed and unable to like see what's going on and come out to the streets together um, are premature. Um, I want to turn to some of the questions that are in the in the Q and A list. Some of them coincide with some of the questions that I had lined up, um, but I think we should you know hear from some of the audience. There are so many interesting questions accumulating. And I'm going to start with one that came in from Ben Nathan's, who's an historian here at Penn um, and a friend of mine. And it actually does coincide with one of my questions. You were talking earlier about, you know, your university experience and uh, studying philosophy. Can you tell us about who your um, inspirations uh, from the past are, poets or philosophers, Russian or non-Russian, uh, musical or non-musical or literary? Um, who is it that you go back to um, in thinking about your art and your activism and agenda? Um, there are a lot of, a lot of Russians on the list. Um, I, uh, my current partner, uh, he's from Argentina and he noticed in the last two years that we've been together, that Russia is really consumed by its own art and music literature, uh, because whenever we share some, um, some references from our childhoods, he would share um, he would share music from all around the world, and I would share only Russian rock or Russian pop. So um, I feel like my main influences are uh, Russian artists uh, and Russian dissidents. Um, when the biggest influence I would say is Russian actionist movement from the '90s, who includes. Um, Asmolovsky, Anatoly Asmolovsky, uh, the person who you might remember, but by building uh, a word dick in, uh, on the Red Square in the 90s. Um, another person is Alek Kulik, who is also yeah. known uh, as Man Dog, but he made a tons of other amazing actions. I really highly recommend you to look into his art. Um, another person is uh, Alexander Brenner, he is known in the West because he painted uh, a dollar sign on Malevich's um, white square in Stadelik Museum in Netherlands. And he actually spent six months in um, jail in Netherlands for, for that uh, piece of art. Uh, the piece of art was um, reportedly restored, but some people say that you still can see the shade of this dollar sign in Malevich's painting. Another person that gave a big boost of inspiration to me when I was 13 or 14 years old was Dmitry Alexandrovich Prigov. Uh, he is a Russian conceptual artist. Uh, he is a poet, but also he would make sculptures and he um, he paints, he sings, he makes pretty much everything. So my approach of exploring um, as many mediums as I like, I took from Dmitry Alexandrovich Prigov. His whole, uh, his whole project, um, he had a lifelong project that was called Dmitry Alexandrovich Prigov, and I call him Alexandrovich for a reason, because he wanted to be called not just Dmitry Prigov, but with his middle name, Dmitry Alexandrovich Prigov. Uh, he also would approach poetry as um, as factory um, as factory making goods. Oh shit! If this phrase makes sense in English, anyway. So let me give you an example. Mass production it's, goods. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thirty-six thousand poems in his lifetime. It's a record. Yes, and uh, I mean it's not easy to achieve that. You cannot achieve that just relying on your. Uh, inspiration. You uh, have show, uh, can have have to have quotas. So when I ended up in jail and I had to mass produce police uniforms, 
I thought a lot about um, I thought a lot about Dmitry Alexandrovich Prigov, and I thought a lot about Vladimir Sorokin, mm -hmm. who is the greatest living Russian writer in my opinion, and uh, his work uh, it's called Norma uh, in in English it will be the norm. <clears throat> Um, influenced me when I was 13, probably. My dad gave this book to me, and many people say that it's really inappropriate for 13 years old to read this book. Yes. It has a lot of scenes like, I don't know, eating cannibalism. Experiments, and yeah, I mean, cannibalism, yeah. like mm, a fucking. Uh, of fucking dead bodies and yeah uh, so some people might argue that i was traumatized by this book so much when i was a kid so i became i became what i have become but i think what that book did to me uh it showed me that art can actually be exciting I, it was like it was a really it had a big shock value for me at that time but i think it was good for my education because um at you know in school at least in russian school when you study literature it's so normal it's so safe and um i bet those guys like pushkin or um, tolstoy i mean i know tolstoy was really um innovative and revolutionary for his times but when you read him in 2006 you feel like oh this is just like old white dude who writes about things that he cares and like why would i care about that so when I when I read Sarokin, I I was really shocked, and I was like, "Oh, can act, art can actually provoke you to think about something." So I feel like not just for me, but for a lot of people uh, who later became part of Faina group, this um, collective that we've been in before Pussy Riot and and Pussy Riot, Sarokin was a big big influence, and from the Western philosophers. For me personally, Judith Butler was a big um, mentor, and I met I met her later. Um, but I was just studying her books, and I was really trying to um, write a coursework uh, based on her books, which was pretty difficult in um, homophobic environment of um, Moscow State University. Uh, but she, she taught me resilience. <laughs> She's an impressive, impressive intellectual. Here's another question from the audience, um, a more uh, historical and political one. Uh, you were born, this comes from Sam Finkelman, who's a PhD candidate here at Penn um, in history. You were born in the Soviet Union in 1989, two years before the collapse. In what ways does the historical legacy of the USSR inform in negative or positive ways your anti-capitalist positions? Uh, more generally, and thinking about uh, residents of the former Soviet Union and Russia in general, in what ways do you think that they are less ready or more ready to seriously think in anti-capitalist ways um, than people in the West as a result of the history of the Soviet Union? And the, uh, for, for sure, they are a less ready to think about socialist politics because of because of their trauma by the Soviet Union and um, the Soviet Union was not was not a good example of socialist poli policies that's for sure so I I still have really hard time in Russia often when I say that I'm I'm an anti-capitalist uh, a lot of people think that I'm just copying um, ideas from people that I meet in other countries, and it's not applicable for Russia. Um, a lot of a lot of young, bright um, Russian kids are attracted to libertarianism for the same reason, uh, for the reason that they are traumatized by uh, the government being involved in every sphere of your life. Mm -hmm. And I remember growing up. Actually, I. I did love to study libertarianism because because I hated my government. I knew that my parents hated my government, um, and like I mean, pretty much every government that we had uh, over the last one hundred twenty years, or maybe longer. Um, and so I was somewhere between anarchism and libertarianism. I never identified myself as libertarian, but I was curious mentally about like what's, what what do they have to say. 
and also yeah a lot of a lot of really bright and smart and, and talented people are drawn drawn to libertarianism in Russia um, but you know later on it became obvious to me that there is <laughs> there is another way for to build um, social a socialist social democracy um, giving people not just freedoms but actually you know economic opportunities and economic basis to uh, fulfill those uh, freedoms because it's one thing to just put everything in constitution and another thing is that people cannot really enjoy it when they have to work with three uh, on three jobs a day just to feed their family so um definitely growing up i i real started to see more and more uh, bad, bad sides of uh, capitalism so um well this is like a lifelong battle for me with uh with my peers in russia because um it's, it's really difficult to to explain but uh, i also feel like just because we have a global um global intellectual space right now um many russian kids um i mean like from 13 to 20 they do read a lot of stuff that comes uh, from from I don't know from thinkers in the West and they they follow they follow Bernie Sanders they follow AOC that and like she's um, a role model for them as well um, they they read Naomi Klein uh, they read uh, they read Noam Chomsky and um, yeah it really helps so I feel like it's a generational issue because even for people of my generation it like we do still have this trauma about Soviet Union so not as many people of my age they would identify themselves as socialists, but people who are even like six years younger than me, it's basically if they were not born <laughs> in Soviet Union, they feel like they can call themselves socialists. And if you're 1989, I don't know. But I know some people, that gives me hope. <laughs> Too close to it. No, but it's an interesting way of thinking about it. It's like you really need to have a generation which does not remember the state socialist system in order to think about different socialisms. There are a bunch of questions. Like when I think about socialism, I don't, I don't see any connection with what we experienced in the, in the USSR. I think it's really different. Like when I think about uh, socialism, I think about stuff like, you know, the Green New Deal and, um, and the USSR did not care about, um, did not really care about people, did not care about workers. So, you know, some people, they say that it was just, um, just autocracy. Some people say um, that it was uh, government, government capitalism, right? But it, it was not something that, um, that, that I have in my mind is ideal. <laughs> and you, I believe too. <laughs> So there are a few questions here um, from various students about LGBTQ plus and also feminist issues. Uh, one from uh, Vita Raskovitsute. Um, what do you think is the most effective approach to driving social change towards the emancipation of LGBTQ plus communities uh, and the feminist cause in, especially in, an, in such a comparatively conservative society as Russia? Um, but there's also um, a more um, informational question really about the current situation in Russia. How is Putin directly anti-feminist? Uh, has Russia gotten worse for women as, a approach, as an approach, uh, as a result of his rise to power? Um, or is the problem uh, just Russia's resistance to change due to Putin's conservative power base? Mm. Um, one thing that's really important to understand about Russia uh, and Russian society that it's not conservative in the same way as you Americans think about it. So um, I actually experienced that um, America in a way is more conservative than Russia generally when you look at the population. Uh, because religion in your country is um, stronger, actually. It has bigger influence than it has influence in Russian politics. Um, the thing about Russia is that it, uh, um, Russia was sec secular for, um, for the most part of the 20th century, and it gave a um, big impact on people's minds. And so even today, a lot of people do identify themselves like when they're being approached by 
sociologists by polls um, um, as religious. They're not really, they don't practice, they don't, they don't never read Bible and they don't really care. They just feel like they have to identify themselves somehow religiously. Um, so Russian society is not really conservative. Um, that's, that's what I see in, in my experience. That was, that's what I see in, um, um, in political um, science about Russia. Um, the thing is, it's constructed. Um, Russian conservative person is, uh, is a construct that's really comfortable for, um, for Putin. Uh, in order to um, to maintain his power, because it's all connected to his promise of stability, um, he tries to serve to this um, imaginary uh, conservative person that I that nobody really saw in life. Uh, if you have a time machine, if you jump in that time machine, you go to the '90s. Um, we uh, we were so them happy about new freedoms in the 90s, including freedoms of gender expression and freedoms of sexual expression. If you see at the pop scene of the 90s, you will see that at least 40% of the performers, they are um, gender bending. They're straight up queer performers. And it didn't shock anyone. And um, a gay um, gay bars were booming, gay parties, queer culture were booming during 90s. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden it, it changed when Putin came to power. And so to me, it proves that it's obviously not about people or their readiness. It's, it's about the government. And, you know, by saying all that, I don't, I don't mean that we don't have homophobes. We have homophobes just as you guys have homophobes. But the thing is, um, you know, one or another action of the government, they enable homophobes to um, uh, to express their hatred, to to be vocal about the hatred, to create um, hate crimes. And we saw that um, three years after the um, the implementation of this terrible homophobic law against propaganda of homosexualism they use the term homosexualism, not me. Um, uh, the rise, um, rise in uh, hate speech and hate, um, ha hatred crimes uh, towards homosexuals or people who are, um, who haters perceive as homosexuals, it rised in three times. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is the same thing that you experienced with Trump because he enabled a lot of bullies and, and haters. Uh, but this is something that happens with us for the last 20 years. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that like the state and the sort of general structures of discourse in politics make something out of people um, and take what is on the ground and then turn it to their own purposes. And I think there's, there's something very similar here to the way that Trumpism has restructured the way that we think about our politics, to the way that Putin has structured the way that politics works around him. But There's I think a question. Putin, um, Putin was in power like really too long. He had to leave a little bit earlier, so then he would, he could live with a good name. I think um, he made a big mistake that he didn't, he didn't leave um, a few years ago, um, because he's going to end up like Alexander Lukashenko. Um, I, I really see that people are pissed off. And I really see that homophobic politics of the Russian government, they actually gave an incredible boost to, um, to the rise of young queer activists. Mm -hmm. And it became like a new norm. It became almost a fashion to be a queer activist. So I'm looking forward to the future. <laughs> No, it's a very similar sort of a, um, a dynamic to the one that you described earlier, right? If the state represses, what it does is it creates the issue and it makes it something that people can gather around as well. Um, here's a question which is potentially following up on this from uh, Catherine Culber. Um, picking up on your comment that Russian people want normal things like democratic freedoms. One feature of this year's election in the United States that has been very depressing to many opponents of Trump is the sense that just as many Americans don't actually want or don't prioritize democracy 
given their ongoing support of Trump uh, or of Trump's attempts to subvert the results of the election. Uh, is that a problem that you have grappled with in your activism in Russia? How do you think about ongoing support for Putin? How, as an activist, do you try, or maybe you don't try, to engage Putin supporters? How do you speak to them? I try to be useful to them. And this is a strategy that I came up with uh, when I was in prison. Um, I realized that it's pretty much impossible, at least to me, to change anyone's mind with direct confrontation. So I've decided to, to just be myself, to live my life and live my life in a decent way, um, in a way I think of a decent life, just be a good person and, and help others uh, without requiring anything back. So sounds really fucking Christian, but, <laughs> but it worked. It did. Um, so after two months of me being in the same prison cell with a Putin supporter, we would, um, we would just talk with her about other issues, like universal human stuff. I don't know, like um, boys' asses, girls' tits, like we would discuss Bible with her. And <laughs> Because I was reading Bible at the time because I needed to prepare myself for the, for our trial. And um and she became she became Pussy Red supporter. And within two months she actually um first she refused to um to be snitch. She was uh, I later I realized that she uh she was put in this prison cell to report on everything I do to the prison administration. So she refused to do that. Instead, she would start to tell me what prison administration thinks about me. Mm. So I turned the spy. And the second thing is um, she stopped being a Putin supporter and she became a Pussy Riot supporter. And she actually became more radical than me. And she asks me to get in touch with her when the revolution is going to happen because she wants to join it. Um, so I was like, oh, it really actually works just to be a good person. So <laughs> when we got out of jail, we decided to be useful and the, like our personal strategy of being useful was to help people to improve prison conditions and uh, prison system is a big problem for a lot of people in Russia. Not so, um, not so many political activists actually do talk about this problem. Um, people talk about political prisoners, but not so much about um, conditions in prison system. Uh, and for just an average Russian person who is not necessarily um, a Pussy Riot supporter, and maybe uh, she is um, she is supporting Putin. For her, it's really important um, uh, in which conditions her son is going to serve his time. So I realized that if we are going to connect with people on like in, um, in just some humanitarian issues, uh, we can bring uh, we can build broader coalition even with those who do not support our views from, from the beginning, but then maybe later they will, maybe not. So Absolutely. yeah, we kind of behave, like started to behave a little bit like, <laughs> like a church <laughs> or like, <laughs> like, like, like a church who, who gives a kids education and being like, yeah, but also it will be really cool if you believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's wonderful the sort of strategy of building a larger platform around shared issues. There are a couple of questions actually in the queue relating to your time in prison. Um, and since we're talking about that, maybe this is an appropriate time to pose them. What was the hardest part of the time that you spent in prison? Um, were, were you tortured physically or emotionally? Um, also, you are extremely brave. How do you say so brave? Also, and this is from a Penn student, just curious if you can talk a little about what the time in prison was like. It was shitty. <laughs> um, but my time in prison was uh, split in two main um, periods. And the first period was pre-trial detention. And this was more in the eventful time because in pre-trial detention, you get to see, um, well, basically you're somehow um, uh, amused by the trial that's happening and there is some movement 
in your life and you feel like oh something actually can change because like what if like all of a sudden the judge will decide to release you mm -hmm. so it felt overall i mean obviously i was <laughs> depressed as fuck because i i was cut from the world that gave me um gave me my inspiration that gave me my courage and i had to look for different sources of inspiration and bravery and just you know reasons to stay alive also the thing that really destroyed me was aesthetics um and it may sound weird but when you end up in prison um in uh the most of the cameras they have just one room for 40 women who all watch one television set and so you don't really get to decide especially if you're new in the camera you don't get to decide what we are going to watch so you're forced to watch Russian TV and it's a weird mix about soap uh, of soap operas, um, pro like so some TV shows that promote cops and how amazing they are and they beat, they beat the bad guys and, and, and Russian political propaganda. So it was like so uh, incredibly sad for me because I never I watched television uh, before in my life. And I just realized uh, how bleak the reality is uh, for uh, millions of Russians who do watch television. And I started to actually understand the reasons why they do support Putin because they consume this amount of propaganda on a daily basis. But that was depressing. Um, still, that part was not the, the worst part. The worst part started when uh, when you get sentenced and you're moved to prison camp. And I loved that quote that we heard earlier uh, of Slavoj that Pusirat showed um, how Gulag never actually died. And it was the biggest revelation for me. And it scares me even today that we never, as a country, we never really sought the system, uh, the prison system that we built in, we started to build in 1929. And ever since we still um, work within the same rules, we, like, we use the same facilities. And even um, oftentimes it's, uh, it's the same families who work over another, like one generation after another in the prison system. Mm -hmm. I was transported to Mardovia uh, to a small, um, countries, um, a small village of Parza, and this is not a diverse society at all. So most of the people who work there, they work uh, generationally as prison guards. And it definitely toughened them up. <laughs> it makes them extremely cruel and it makes them think that their only role in life is to punish people and to oppress the will of another human being. And it's really difficult. Factory factory town of prison. I think there are places yeah. like that. There are places like that in California as well. Um, and then the United yeah, think States. About it. It, that's incredible. And, and you have to live with them. Like some people have to live with them for 15 years. Uh, for me, it was only a year and a half. And uh, slave labor system is a big giant problem. We work on really old equipment um, because because corruption is the biggest problem in Russia nowadays. So even if the government gives some money to um, prison to buy new equipment, obviously, <laughs> obviously, like what a fool would actually buy equipment when they can buy a house. So they build a house and we keep, keep, keep making these police uniforms and really old equipment and hurting ourselves. But because we don't have any rights because we are prisoners even if we die of overworking because we work for 17 hours a day um even if we die from that they would Whoa. say oh it was a heart attack and um and nobody was going to investigate it 17 hour a day workday was actually something that you experienced there i personally worked for eight hours because they didn't want me uh to didn't knew that i have media and i have lawyers so but the problem was my eight hours workday that I still had to perform the same quota in eight hours as other prisoners would make in 16, 17 hours workday. So it was just another side of the coin. It was not really a privilege. But it, was, it was really problematic to me because I had to, um, I had to do it really fast. I had to sew really fast. 
they didn't know how to do it. They don't give you education before you go to the sewing machine. Um, basically, the education is fear, and that's the biggest educate um, the biggest um, educational technique in our prison system. They tell you that if you're not going to learn how to do the separation in three days, it means that you're not only you're going to be punished, but the whole um, the whole unit, another 50 women are going to be punished because of you. And I mean, by punished means like not being able to go to the toilet, not being able to wash themselves, not being able to eat or smoke, a lot of women smoke in prison, um, not being able to talk with their relatives for uh, one month just because of you. Yeah, that sounds terribly frightening. I can't imagine. And then they just shit, they, they, I mean, obviously all those prisoners, they're not saints. <laughs> they, uh, after that, they give a lot of shit to you for depriving them from this little um, moments of happiness that they used to have in prison. That's impressively harsh. Um, so we have a few questions here about um, your work as an artist uh, and as an activist and about the relationship between art and activism. Um, so one um, is taking us back to the question of trap in a certain way. Uh, this is from Brett Robert, who's a Penn PhD student um, in history. Um, so first a comment and then a question. In 2019, Latin trap artist Bad Bunny and rapper Residente sat outside the governor's residence in Puerto Rico um, all night live streaming. Uh, and then he got in for a, for a conversation uh, demanding a conversation about gender, anti-queer violence, um, after the murder of queer rapper Kevin Frett. Um, so the change in trap, uh, the comment says, is that, that you are seeking is underway. Um, the question is, have you ever tried to work with political punk acts um, or their labels outside of Russia? Um, I'm thinking of people like Jello, Biafra, Joey Shithead of DOA, bands like Angelic Upstarts, labels like Alternative Tentacles, among others. Have you found these types of labels and infrastructure to be different from the mainstream capitalist music infrastructure? And if not, what kinds of music distribution infrastructure could you imagine that would eliminate or perhaps mitigate the capitalist paradigm and embody your ideals? Uh -huh. I love that song of uh, Bad Bunny and Resident. I included it in uh, some of my DJ sets that I've been doing virtually this year. Um, I celebrate when big, um, really popular artists talk about political issues. I don't really understand why more of them do not do that, but you know, it's, I, I guess the change is on the way. Um, regarding working with um, indie labels, well, I'm basically um, my own label most of the time, so I, I, I'm not really looking for um, for joining any other label, unless um, unless something like a really fantastic will appear. I'm not actively seeking out because um, so we've been in a business of building institutions since 2014 when we got out of jail. We built Media Zona, the media outlet, and. Zona Brava, this um, NGO that helps prisoners. So we do have um, we do have some experience on self-organizing and um, organizing work, coordinating work of people around us. So I feel pretty comfortable just um, doing whatever traditional label would do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I actually enjoy freedom a lot because um, because a pusterite is in a really unique position. It has so many supporters, people with different talents who are ready to join in, uh, to hop in for um, a day or two or, 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 or a month or a year or one project or 10 projects. So I, I, I just facilitate all those amazing um, creative inputs and, and, and I feel like I financed this art of being a curator of, um, of all these creative inputs that people want to give to Pussy Riot. Because Pussy Riot, for me and for, for most of the people who join Pussy Riot, is bigger than, than just um, music act. It's, uh, it's, a political, it's a political battle. Um, and a nexus, really, for interconnection, as you're pointing out. It's a, it's, it's, um, a platform in itself which can actually unite other people. 
Yeah. Um, there's a question here that really asks, um, you know, kind of a follow up to this question, really, um, from Edith Close, who's a colleague from another institution. Has Nadia been in touch with U.S. performance artist activists like Kehinde Wiley, the sculptor of Rumors of War? Um, do you have anything to talk about with, you know, art activists, performance activists uh, from outside of Russia? Um, yeah, of course. Um, well, I I wish I could be in touch with a bigger amount of people, but I, I'm i super conservative socially, um, not only during pandemic, but just in general. I'm like one of those people who live inside of my shell. It's really difficult for me to get out. Um, but um, I am in touch with, uh, with some important people in my life, like um, the Yes Men, um, amazing um, activists from the United States. Another person who is really influential to me is Marina Abramovich. Um, mm -hmm. Another person is hmm, Doreen Electra. Yeah, I mentioned I mentioned them earlier. And if you didn't hear songs of Doreen Electra, you definitely should. Got it. Um, so. A more oh, abstract yeah. Shepherd Fairy, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Shepherd Fairy, our, our ideal. Hope springs eternal. Um, a more abstract question about art and activism. Um, and this is again from Ben Nathans, uh, my colleague, the historian here. Um, do you sometimes experience contradictions between activism via performance art, including punk, um, and activism in the form of human rights advocacy, building institutions of civil society. Um, are those two things, you know, the art activism and art itself perhaps, and political activism sometimes at odds for you, or are they always in harmony? And my question that I didn't get to answer, uh, I didn't get to ask, uh, was really like going to even one greater level of abstraction here, uh, I guess. And that is how do you view the relationship between art and politics? Um, at this point in human history, is there such a thing as a non-political art, um, or um, is all art political? <laughs> How do you view that relationship? Um, I think um, that all art exists in political context, for sure, and um, being consciously being a apolitical artist is a political choice. Um, I don't know if it's correct to call this kind of artists. Um, political artists? No, probably not, but yeah. I mean, the, you, you never exist within, um, um, outside of uh, political systems. So it was really childish. Um, it sounded really childish for me um, always when artists would be like, oh, I don't like, I don't exist within politics. I'm like, oh, then really? <laughs> like, what do you eat then? Like, where do you go to? <laughs> <laughs> like when you need to extract your tools, I don't know. <laughs> Where are you kids studying? Um, yeah, but um, I guess with years, as all of us, I'm becoming a little bit more patient because I I used to like when I was seventeen, I was just like I wanted to punch punch in the face all people who like all other artists who would claim that they they want to be uh, they want to exist outside of politics. And now I'm much more patient. I feel like it's their choice. And but I, I really want people to be aware that this is a political position to be a political, a political artist. <laughs> if like as long as they do understand it and they're fine with this and they have like a good explanation to themselves why they choose to be like that, I'm perfectly fine. Um regarding interconnections between uh, politics and art in my personal life. Um, I don't, I don't have, I don't experience um, big contradictions. And I think um, because I have the privilege of existing, of working within community and community really helps because, you know, we can, if, if one person is tired of um, managing something, we can pass it to someone else and it's still going to work. And when you're an individual artist, that's this much more difficult, but there is a deep reason why I, um, 
like I, I'm in the business of building communities and movements because it's really comfortable. You build this ecosystem and then you can pass your tasks and then pick up tasks from people if they're not happy with those. Like for example, uh, in 2014, we worked mostly on creating this media zone, um, this media outlet, and we traveled around the world to speak about prisoners' issues, and we spoke about prisoners' issues in Russia. But then a year later, I realized that I'm not happy with being just a, just human rights activists, uh, activist and not an artist. And I realized it just makes me empty though I do a really important job but it makes me not fulfilled and so I just passed a lot of um a lot of work to Peter Verzilov and he he's really he's really like genuinely happy with managing stuff uh, so he's <laughs> managing a lot of media on right now I'm like yeah sure <laughs> if I can just uh like do more creative stuff yeah, and sometimes he's bored with that too, and he asks me to do something. I, t I think the community is the best thing that was invented by human beings. That's why we have civilization, right? <laughs> it's good to be able to delegate. Um, we're getting towards the end of our, our time together, but there are a couple of questions here which I think can be grouped together. Um, and they really address uh, the fact that you, over the past um, you know, decade, have traveled back and forth quite a bit between the United States and Russia. Um, and you've seen the transformations in the American political scene also at close hand uh, over the course of the past four years during the presidency of Trump. Um, the audience and I personally would be interested in your, your view on how politics has changed in the United States in the past four years, uh, but also on the intersections between Russian politics and Western politics. Uh, one of our questioners, uh, Hilla Cohen, who's a PhD student in comparative literature here uh, at Penn, asks what your thoughts are about the affinity that many prominent Russian libertarians have expressed for Trumpism uh, and other far-right ideologies uh, from the United States and Canada, that there is, a, there is an oppositional community in Russia which is affi affiliated not necessarily with left opposition in, in the states, but with right opposition. Mm -hmm. um, so those are two really separate questions, the relationship between Russian uh, political situations and American ones, but also your views in general on what has happened to American politics in the last four years. I didn't, I didn't know personally any oppositional libertarians in Russia who love Trump. Maybe some of them do. No, the um, people who like uh, figures such as Jordan Peterson. Oh, Jordan um, Peterson! Yeah, so many people love Jordan Peterson in Russia. But I think it's like to me, it's all explained. But like what we discussed in the previous question, people just feel like they can um, they can deal with all the issues by themselves, and they don't need um, interference of the government. But obviously, like. <laughs> Most of those people, they're coming from really privileged backgrounds and like one of the founders of Russian Libertarian Party, he's um, like an icon for a lot of Russian young kids these days. Uh, Mikhail Sviatov, uh, he's coming from almost like an oligarch family, he was studying in some fancy university in um, Japan and then he went back and he started to work um, on, on this, um, on building Libertarian Party. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's not a crime to be wealthy, but it's kind of a crime not to check your privileges and and just assume that everyone has a rich dad like you have. I don't like that. Um, regarding American politics, this is so, um, I don't know, like everything that's happening in the world politically and I may sound crazy when I say that, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited about everything that's happening. It shows me and other members of my community that we actually made the right choices at some point and we had right intuitions. Um, when we started with the right, as I said, like we were completely underground, we were in a niche and we never, we were dreaming about uh, spreading our politics but we never thought it's really gonna happen you know you can dream about building a house but who's 
like who's going to build a house when you live in capitalist economy and you can't really pay even rent <laughs> so but you know sometimes dreams they come true so i see i see that happening in the russian political scene and american political scene and in um uh, what was happening in america the the first sign of uh, changing times for me was um occupy wall street obviously yeah. like for many of you, I think. Um, I was amazed by persistence and um, bravery of uh, activists. I was really shocked that um, a really important issue that I've been running around for years um, entered um, American mainstream papers. I thought this country is so capitalist, so it's even impossible to raise issue of 1% against 99%. Uh, in, in in New York Times, um, but then I was even more excited when Bernie Sanders um, transformed uh, that insight into bigger, like really big political movement. And um, I remember I couldn't collect my jaw from the floor when I I started to think uh, I started to see positive mentions of socialism and socialist in um, in American press, and and not in Democracy Now or young Turks, but in, in mainstream political media. And I was like, oh, Jesus, the times are really changing. And this year, um, you know, this tragic event, death of George Floyd and other innocent people um, in the arms of police, uh, it created enormous, um, enormous blast of political imagination. It was something that I was looking for forever and I've been asking people to dream dangerously and to think about alternative futures and actually imagine a world that can be pretty much different, pretty, like really different from um, the current one because we've been trapped in this mantra that there is no alternative. That's a uh, famous Margaret Thatcher's phrase and it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, I feel like in 2020 it started to change because I've seen uh, so many asking these questions like, should we reimagine our public safety? Should we even have police and institutions? Should we radically um, change the funding and relocate the funding to um, to the social workers and, and people who are actually want to help people instead of killing them? And um, I've been living around those questions as uh, an activist, Antifa, and <laughs> anarchist for my last, I don't know, 20 years, but uh, I never seen actually so many people asking them. And I feel like something is going to change because um, it's like, uh, you, you cannot ignore it. <laughs> it's a very hopeful moment in that sense. And I'm really grateful to you for articulating the ways in which it's um, a, a really hopeful moment for the world when in fact we're shaken loose from our uh, seemingly safe yet in fact unjust and unequitable world and asked to think about how it can be made better. Um, it is actually an incredibly possibility filled moment. I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking that this might actually be the time and the nice round spot to finish our discussion. Um, we yeah. have Political imagination. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like a beautiful end to the discussion. I think we've handled quite a few of the questions uh, which have been posed, certainly not all of them. And I want to take just a moment here to thank the Andrea Mitchell Center uh, for organizing this event. Uh, I want to thank all of the participants in the Q&A and the audience for showing up. Jeff Green um, and Matt Roth from the Andrea Mitchell Center in particular for putting this together and doing all of the legwork to make it happen. Uh, and especially you, Nadia, for coming. Your work is inspiring and beautiful. And uh, I'll just echo one of the questioners. You're incredibly brave. We're all really pleased that you took the time to have a conversation with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks, everyone, for joining. All right. I think we're going to round up with that then. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.